So welcome everyone to the Western Canadian webinar series. Oops. And tonight, the title of our presentation is, It Isn't All About Heads. And our fearless speaker is Dr. David Spencer. And everyone is welcome to our webinars and they are free. However, we do have expenses, such as Meetup, Zoom, the web page, and things like that. So please donate any amount you can. Just go to the RMA web page and click on the donate button. Now, tonight we are going to have the complete presentation, and then we will have a Q&A. Now, if, if and when you have a question, uh, raise your hand using the hand raising icon which you can find uh, at the reaction button below. Uh, we'll call on you when your hand is raised and ask you to unmute yourself and ask your question. And after you've asked your question, would you please lower your hand or else I will get confused. <laughs> okay, and now I will turn it over to David. Back to me, let's... Sorry, click the share button, but that's not uh, that's not what that is. Uh, it's the it's the it's the uh, it's share the whole. That's uh, anyway. It's something else altogether. So, mom, don't forget to uh, mute yourself. Yeah. Yes, everyone, mute yourself, please. Yeah, mute yourselves. Mute yourselves. Yeah, I'm I'm talking now. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I traveled to Easter Island in October 2009, which is their spring, as part of a trip, a trip that took my uh, two older brothers, their wives, and me to South Georgia and the uh, Falkland Islands. Uh, many of the pictures I will show today are ones I took uh, on that trip. Um, unfortunately, I'm not a great photographer. The first two were taken by my sister-in-law. I, I saw the rainbow and took a picture, but when she saw it, she moved until the rainbow ended right over some heads in the distance. So she's a much better photographer. Uh, some of the pictures are from National Geographic and the Smithsonian and other places around the web. I don't give proper uh, credit. I took more than 430 pictures and videos, so settle back. A lot of people have uh, studied Easter Island, the story of its people, its geology, but in the end, a lot is still a mystery. There is a lot on Wikipedia about it, for example, but it includes contradictions. I am certain that some of the things I am going to tell you are wrong. I just don't know which ones. So here's my version of the story. Here is the family, my, my two brothers, their wives, and the woman in the blue jacket is our guide who's telling us something dramatic about this hole in the ground, which may be a lava tube, um, or it's a cave, it's a cave which may be a lava tube, and possibly at some point people lived there. I don't remember what she was saying at the time. Um, Easter Island really is in the middle of nowhere. That's Easter Island in the middle here. That's South America. New Zealand is way over here somewhere. Um, its nearest inhabited neighbor is the Pitcairn Islands, which are 2,000 kilometers away, and there's not much there. It belongs to uh, to Chile. Chile just it belongs to Chile because Chile just said so. Uh, Santiago is nearly 4,000 kilometers away. Oh, I forgot to check. Did anybody, everybody can see my my sharing? Nice big picture. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. I uh, should have checked that before I started. Um, it is a triangle about 14 miles by seven miles with an area of 63 square miles. That's the whole thing. 63 square miles or 163 square kilometers. Um, it is a volcanic island. There are three main volcanoes, and you can see my my mouse, right? Okay. 
What mouse? Uh, my pointer. Kidding, I see it, I see it. Yeah, okay. um, this is, there are three main volcanoes which form the corners of the triangle. Um, they erupted from 100,000, 800,000 years ago and are considered dormant, although steam was seen about 100 years ago. Uh, so 163 square miles. For comparison, the big island of Hawaii is 4,000 square miles. So this is a little bitty island. Um, there's really only one town, uh, Hangaroa. The people who live there call it Rapa Nui. They call themselves Rapa Nui. They speak a Polynesian language, Rapa Nui. You see a theme here? Um, most, uh, however, speak only Spanish. Um, many of them also speak English. They call the island uh, Naval of the World or End of the World. We're really not sure. And both of those things make sense. Um, Polynesians traveled to Easter Island by canoe somewhere between 800 and 1700 years ago. There's a dispute about that. Uh, perhaps in the Marquesas Islands, about 3,700 kilometers, which is about a month long trip in a canoe, or it might've been from Mangareva, a similar distance in time. They brought with them sweet potatoes, bananas, taro, sugarcane, chickens, Polynesian rats, and a cultural tradition of carving statues. So the statue on the left is uh, from the market. That's a stone sculpture from the Marquesas Island. Uh, and on the right, that's a wooden uh, tiki from Hawaii, um, which I believe is a female tiki who looks really, really fierce to me. Um, so Dutch uh, explorers, showed up there on Easter Sunday, 1722, and called it Pas Eiland, which is Dutch for Easter Island, and saw all these giant statues. Uh, 50 to 80 years later, another trip by Europeans saw that most of the statues on platforms, or Ahu, had been knocked down and many of them broken. We aren't sure why. There are indications that some may have been knocked down by earthquakes and tsunamis, but it is certain that many were deliberately knocked down by people who arranged for them to fall on a rock so the neck was broken. It has a subtropical climate, but it's not quite like other tropical islands. For example, it has no coral at all. Uh, this means it doesn't have an abundance of pretty and edible fish nearby. Uh, so they had to use canoes to go out and catch fish. They also caught and ate uh, porpoises. To build canoes, you need trees. When they first arrived, there were about 16 million palm trees and rich soil and a lot of seabirds. The seabirds would have nourished the soil. As time went on, they cut down the trees, they burned them for heat and cooking and for cremations. They used up all the big trees, they ate the seabirds, the rats ate the nuts of the trees and the eggs of the seabirds. The rich soil eroded, so they had trouble growing trees and other plants as well. This is a uh, rock garden. So this is a raised bed with a rock mulch to keep moisture in. Uh, so you, you do all this and then you pull the mulch apart uh, away and put a plant in. Um, and this is just uh, another, this is this is, it doesn't show so well in the picture, but this is actually a raised bed as well. And I think that's a, a sweet potato plant uh, growing in there, but this is to keep the wind, the dry wind, the drying wind uh, off. Uh, so this is about conserving moisture. Uh, there's not much soil there now, and the land is very porous, so fresh water is scarce. Two of the volcano craters have lakes in them, um, this one looks particularly attractive for take your, uh, your jar and uh, go and get fresh water from that lake. Um, it's quite a hike. This one's a little more accessible and uh, it has nice reeds growing in it. But that's it for fresh water on the, on the island. Uh, ironically, during the time we were there, it rained a lot, but uh, that's not... Uh, it, 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 run, it runs off, it runs away, off quickly. 
Um, so it was an ecological catastrophe. There is debate about how much of that was caused by the people who lived there, clearly a, a lot, but there was also natural climate change going on, changing the, uh, the winds. At one point, there were about 15,000 people there, but by the time Europeans arrived, there were only two to 3,000. Then the Peruvians and others came and took people for slaves, a process known as blackbirding, and gave them smallpox and other diseases so that by 1877, they were down to 100 people. Only 36 of those have descendants. Uh, now living there are around 5,000 people of a mixture of ancestries. In the 19th century, the indigenous people were pushed off their land and a lot of the land was used for sheep farming, which didn't turn out well. There is no port. There is a small harbor, but it is not suitable for ships, just small boats, which is a problem in the modern era. A supply ship must anchor offshore, then small boats go back and forth. If the weather is rough, no food or other supplies can land. They do have uh, an airport with a, with a very long runway. It was uh, modified with a lot of support from the Americans who wanted it as an alternate emergency landing spot for the space shuttle. If you think about that, you know, the Pacific Ocean is very large and if your shuttle is coming down and can't make it to California uh, or this, even South America, then there's this you know, one island. So very long, uh, very long runway. Um, I showed you one earlier. So this is, they built some houses out of the local stone. Uh, after they had no trees, they had no wood for roofs. Um, this is, these two are either houses or chicken houses. Um, they're kind of interchangeable. They look pretty sturdy, but um, awfully dark. Um, Easter Island people had no metal. They did have some, uh, some clay, but then to fire clay, you need wood. So that is something of the, the history of the, uh, the people, which sadly isn't so different from a lot of other places in the world. Um, so what makes Easter Island interesting? Statues. So this is a, an ahu, a platform with uh, 15 or so statues uh, on it. You'll see references to, this, to, this, to these statues uh, again later. These um, little bumps, these are, these are rocks in front of the Ahu. Each of those may be covered. That's what I thought the guide said. Uh, maybe cremains underneath that. So um, the Ahu became a, a place for a, for a cemetery. Um, so why did they carve these, these statues or moai? The general opinion is that it is a religious thing, ancestor worship, expecting the ancestors to help them. Each moai was a statue of a chief and the people competed to see who could put up the biggest one because that would mean their chief was the most important. The moai on Ahu near the ocean are always facing inland, facing communities. The statues on the slope of the volcano Rano Raku uh, are facing down the slope, which leads to the populated areas. Uh, some really interesting geochemistry shows that carving a statue results in a lot of small bits of rock, which weather quickly and add valuable minerals such as potassium to the soil downslope of the quarry. Uh, this meant that crops could grow better than other areas. Some researchers got excited about this and declared that this was the reason for the statues. Well, I'm pretty sure the Rapa Nui people noticed that plants flourished downhill of the quarry. I'm also pretty sure there are more efficient methods of turning tuff into minerals than carving an 80 ton monolith. How do you carve a statue out of solid rock with harder rocks? And a lot of banging. No metal at all. Uh, Thor Heyerdahl found that wetting the stone made it easier to carve. The harder rocks 
would have been basalt or maybe obsidian. I think this is a piece of obsidian in the picture. Uh, it might be basalt. Uh, I can't tell anymore. Um, it may have depended on what level of detail they, they needed. Uh, obsidian was found at a different quarry. So they had to bring the, the, the actually the, the obsidian and basalt had to bring it to the, uh, to the quarry from other quarries. Uh, when they were done bashing, uh, they rubbed the surface with pumice to smooth it out. The moai are monoliths carved from a single piece of rock. Usually what you see is just a head. Oh, here's the quarry, sorry. Uh, so if you, if you look at the size of this statue, which was, wasn't finished, these are people in the foreground. So any sort of you know, fake photography with forced perspective is the wrong way around. These are the people in front of the statue. And these uh, vertical parts or straight parts are probably where other statues were, were carved off and then taken away. That may be a part statue laying there. Uh, Easter Island is covered with pieces of statues. I wonder if that's part of one there. Anyway, you can, you can see a, a lot of these things. Um, so usually what you can see is just a head, but that is because the ones that are, weren't on Ahu are partially buried. Here's one that was, uh, that was dug out. So you can see there's the ground level, there's the head, and then they dug down and here's a whole uh, body underneath it with, uh, with carvings on the back. We'll talk about that later. So here's just the, the I'm just showing a piece of one. You can see here are, it, it's the whole torso and there are the hands, person's hands are, are, are there. Um, and occasionally they go a bit, uh, shall we say below the torso. There are about a thousand moai and about half are, uh, are still at the quarry incomplete. There are a couple of reasons given for this. One is that some may just be outlines in the rock that was all they were meant to be petroglyphs. Another reason is that if you are carving a statue to honor your ancestor and there's a flaw in the rock that gives him a big hole in his face, you probably give up and start a new one. Uh, a popular theory is that the Moai carving era ended abruptly and they were just abandoned. Uh, many tools were found scattered in the quarry. It is, uh, and they've ended up in museums all over the world. It is often said that they spent too much effort carving these statues, and, and maybe that's true, but they carved them for about 400 years and only finished fewer than a thousand. So that's only two statues per year. Now they're pretty big, but uh, how big an effort is that? They are, uh, will not surprise you, I'm afraid. They're all male, except for one. And she's smaller than the rest. So she's about two meters tall, I think. Only one has legs. Um, it's kneeling. It is, uh, the, the story is told about it, it's supposed to be in honor of a worker who died in the quarry. And it's again, only about uh, two meters tall or so. The moai are usually carved from tough, a solidified ash carved at and from the volcano Rano Raraku. The tallest standing one is 10 meters high and weighs about 80 tons. There is an unfinished one, which would have been 21 meters tall and weigh 150 tons. Um, there's speculation, why is it unfinished? Maybe somebody figured out that they were never gonna be able to move this thing, you know, twice as heavy as, as the biggest one they'd already done, or it was just wasn't finished because they stopped making any of them. Uh, the typical size is four meters and 12 tons. And then there are some small ones like the female I showed you, and here's the, just the head of one, a very nice uh, head. And that's in their museum, which I'll talk about later. Uh, in, in the Easter Island Museum. 
There are also about 52 moai carved from other materials such as basalt. Uh, and this is one that's carved from basalt and it's in the British Museum. A few moai on Ahu had a top added called a pokeo, which looks like a hat. It's red, which doesn't show up well in, in these pictures, um, but is generally believed to represent hair, a top knot or man buns. So this is a modern Maori uh, warrior and that's the kind of thing they have on top of their heads. Little artistic license, but could be. Um, having a big red uh, pakeo uh, makes your moai much more impressive. It is uh, carved from scoria, a lighter rock, more like pumice. Uh, the bottom of the pakeo is hollowed out a bit, which stabilizes it on, you can imagine, putting a, that round thing on top of a, of a statue. Um, this is, there are also these pakeo just lying around on the, on the surface. And just for scale, uh, this fellow, my oldest brother is about six feet tall. Uh, so this is a medium sized pakeo. It is scar carved from scoria, which is a lighter rock, uh, more like pumice, but it's not light enough to float. After the moai were put in place, they were brought to life by adding eyes. And this was a, a, a religious ceremony with the, 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 the awakening of the, of the Moai. Um, the eyes were made from coral with pupils from obsidian or scoria. Well, that's great. How do you get that 10 ton wig on top of the statue? Uh, people haven't worried much about that but a suggested way is based on its being cylindrical. You build a ramp, so imagine, look, that, that's all rubble. That's a huge amount of rock. Um, and you make a, make a slope and it's cylindrical and you can take a couple of ropes. The way they're showing doesn't quite work. Um, so I'm gonna show you a, 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 an actual uh, use of this technique, which is called uh, par buckling. So here you have a string going under this pakeo uh, and then over the pakeo. So it's just a, just a half loop that comes right, or a full loop comes, comes right back. How's that? So, when you got something that's a cylinder, you can you can move it easily. Is the bottom line. How easy is it to carve scoria? In an area which had been used in the 19th century for sheep, we found a scoria boulder. The shepherd had gotten tired of the sun and the rain watching the sheep, um, and carved out a shelter. So this is just a bored shepherd, made himself probably him. Um, a hole to hide in. I told you the statues on platforms are all knocked down, but I showed you pictures of them standing up. But they were only stood up again in the last 60 years with the help of, of modern technology. Uh, one country that did a lot of work on this project was Japan. And to thank them, the Rapa Nui people loaned one of the Moai to Japan. So the Japanese picked it up, put it on a ship, exhibited it, and then sent it back. The Rapa Nui named it the Wanderer. So you have to look closely, but these are not carvings on the statue. These lines are rope burns. A side effect of a rock being easy to carve means it is also easy to damage. So the wanderer has some damage. I'm gonna go back to the raising a statue picture, point out a couple of things. So uh, this you know, crane, uh, uh, rope and uh, you know, local, local trees. 
But look at where they are putting the pieces across, just under the chin and just under the eyebrows. That's um, the, this, this forehead looks pretty impressive, but I think it's actually in part um, a feature to make the statue movable. And we'll, uh, we'll see something about that a little later. Like if you look at the statue of David in the sling, you know, the sling touch, you know, contacts his, his, his back. That's because to make it just waving in the air is, is structurally very unsound. So I think that, that, that heavy brow may not reflect what people actually looked like, but it's just there uh, to make it easy to work with the statue. Um, so the Japanese sent theirs back. The statues in the British Museum were simply stolen. That one I showed you, the basalt one, a British naval officer found it in somebody's house. And the British just tore the house down to get it out and carried it off. It was given by the British Admiralty to Queen Victoria, and she donated it to the British Museum. Very kind of her. Rapa Nui has asked for it back, but it hasn't happened yet. Its name is Hoa Hakana'ai, meaning stolen friend. Uh, Tor Heyerdahl dug up the one female Moai and with permission, took it back to Norway for research purposes. The Rapa Nui asked for it back and it was returned. There are others in museums uh, around the world like the uh, Louvre. The Ahu, are made from basalt walls with a covering of scoria and a fill of rubble. It may be that those big platforms were more work than the statues. The basalt pieces are fitted together pretty nicely with a superficial resemblance to what was done by the Incas, but it is not as fancy. This is the British Museum uh, Moai, which has, you know, the, so the basalt is, is a, a finer rock, so you have more detail. Um, so some of the Moai have detailed carvings on them, including birds. So can you see the bird? If you look here, there's a figure. Well, okay, first there's a, there's a paddle. There's a face. There's another face, you know, sort of normal looking human face with a paddle. And that it's an extremely long tongue, which is a little disturbing. Um, this is a bird man. It's just something with arms and a beak, but standing upright doesn't, you know, birds don't have arms uh, of wings that shape. And then there's this carving here. It looks somewhat like a, like an M. There's a better shot of it here. So, so there's a V here and then an arm there, an arm there and a piece down there. This thing here, this black on white, is a modern Polynesian tattoo. And this is a photograph of a sooty turn in flight. We'll talk about sooty turns a little later, but that's a bird in flight tattoo. It uh, works for me. And this, by the way, this is the back of this statue. Um, this, these lines here are a girdle or a belt, which holds up a loincloth in the front. And there's a ring which tightens it or something. There are a few uh, Moai with carvings on their front that look like a European ship. So there's the carving. And then uh, an artist drew on, on paper exactly what he or she saw on this carving. And I think it's a pretty good representation. I don't think they're cheating. Um, in fact, I think I can see things that, that they didn't render, but anyway. So that's a ship. That's a ship attached to a, a very nice turtle. You say, why does a ship have a turtle? So does that look like a ship? This is a replica of Captain Cook's ship. It's not, I'm not saying that Captain Cook, well, Captain Cook did go to the island, but it's just a representative of a ship of the time. You can see the three masts are not the same height like they're in the carving, but this is your first ship you've ever seen. Um, you can give it a little artistic license. Uh, and there's, and there's, the, uh, there's the turtle. So the, the islanders will only have seen this thing hanging off the front that then gets dropped into the water. 
maybe it's a turtle. We think of it as a, just an anchor. Um, so when were these ship carvings done? Well, we think that the, the, the era of making statues had stopped before the first Europeans arrived. So the carvings were done you know, long after the statue was in place. Maybe that's just Rapa Nui vandalism, a Rapa Nui version of graffiti. And early Banksy, maybe they could sell them. I don't know. So I brought back my own to uh, Moai. And here they are with their pakeo. Um, and they do have carvings on their back. So there's there's the sooty turn on the back. And on the, my carving, you can actually see the head a little bit. At least you can, I can imagine I can see the head a little bit, which I couldn't on the, on the other one. There are also some carvings that look very different. This one I've, I think is scary. Uh, one of the theories is that this was carved during a period of starvation. So that's what the people you know, looked like being skeletal. Uh, another theory is that they were done much later for tourists like me. Easter Island has thousands of petroglyphs, mostly related to birds, but also to fish. So here's one. So here's a face, kind of a big nose, but that's there's a there's a face, and here's the bird man again. A little hard to see. A little imagination to, to to see it, but there's a beak, there's an eye, and there's some arms. Anyway, it's a, it's a piece of rock, and it's got carvings on it. And the carvings have been there for perhaps hundreds of years, and sort of. As you walked around, there's another face. Can you all see the face? There's the ear, there's another ear, there's the eyes, there's a nose, there's a mouth. And there may be other things on this rock. We're just walking along and, and you see petroglyphs. That's all they had. They had no wood anymore, so they couldn't, you know, people like to carve things. They didn't have anything to make paint with. Uh, so they carved rock, which they had a lot of. This boulder broken boulder is in the museum. And I don't know why they thought it was so very special because to me, it looks kind of dull. But anyway, there's, there's a bird, another bird, maybe three birds on this face of the rock. And there's a fish. Um, my imagine says this is a nice big fat tuna fish, which is something they would have uh, been very excited to find. This is somebody else's photograph, so I won't take the credit or blame, because obviously somebody's enhanced it. But when I talked about the beak and the eye and so on, this is, this is what this person saw and then took some, uh, I'm gonna have to say they took some paint and enhanced it. But I think the carvings, I think it's fair. Uh, the lines are there, they just uh, enhanced the, the contrast. Uh, so there was a Birdman cult, which may have grown at about the same time the Moai were knocked down. When we look at the history of the world, there are many, many examples of people who worshipped chieftains and priests because they promised that they could persuade the gods to provide rainfall and promote the welfare of the people. All the people needed to do was provide the priests with food and wealth. That worked great up until it didn't. For example, when some climate event caused the crops to fail, the people rightfully um, resented the priests and stopped giving them the goodies and generally rebelled. Oops. All too often, this just resulted in a new group of priests who promised they could persuade the gods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so when things started going bad on Easter Island, they stopped carving the statues. Then a little later, they knocked the statues down and the Birdman cult took over. It may not be coincidental that the statues were knocked down after Europeans had arrived and killed a dozen or so people and demonstrated their superior killing technology and their boat technology. Um, one of the things the Birdman cult focused on was a couple of small islands just off the southwest corner of Easter Island where seabirds still lived. There was an annual competition between clans. 
when the birds, Sooty turns, when the Sooty turns return to lay eggs, each clan chieftain chose a representative to go down the cliff, swim one and a half kilometers to the island, take an egg, strap it to his forehead, swim back and climb the cliff. The first one to succeed, his chieftain was the victor. He got to run things for the next year. A theory is that there had been warfare, but with such a small island with few people, this was disastrous, and someone came up with this alternative. So this is, uh, those are the, the two islands, nothing on that island. So it'd be this island, the seabirds uh, were on. And here's this is just a view over top of some of the petroglyphs with, I'm gonna say a bird man again, but I'm really not very convinced this time. Something carved on the, on the rock, yeah, smiley, smiley face. Uh, so they have a very nice museum there, which includes the female Moai, which is, which is here. I showed it earlier, but it's another view. And also examples of tools, and maybe I'll convince you that some of the things are weapons. So this is a, you know, a broken statue with, with the, the eye in it. So you can see it up close. There's a pupil made of, of scoria. This is a case, I have two views of it, with some things in it. Now I could argue that these are tools. So this would be a chisel. So you put that on the rock and you take uh, another a hammer thing or just a stone in your hand and you whack on this end and you carve out the, uh, the statue. Not so sure about this one. There's another view. Yeah, maybe for hitting something really hard. So uh, a thing to, to remember is that on this island, there were humans, there were rats, there were chickens and, and possibly seabirds, but there were no larger animals. So you didn't need to defend yourselves from, from anything uh, except other people. They said really fierce chickens. Uh, these are to do with fishing. So that's a fish hook carved from, uh, from shells. This I think is a, maybe for making nets. It's a double ended, it's, it's a needle with, with two holes. And I think I've seen that for making nets somewhere. So, okay, again, could be peaceful fishing tools. However, I can't have, I don't have any other interpretation of this, but that these are, are spear points uh, things because you wouldn't carve a rock with this. You, know, you put that you know, end into the rock and hit this end, but this is way too small. Why would you do that? Uh, but this is great for tying onto you know, a stick and throwing at somebody or just poking them. And this thing is a big wooden club. And I have no other interpretation that these are weapons. Uh, well, I'm not sure these are just round balls. They could be for hitting people or they could be for fishing. I don't know. Um, I showed you the pakeo that was hollowed out and, and that may be what it was, but this is looks rather similar. And this is a, a funerary urn. So this is the thing you put the dead body in somehow with uh, wood or other burning material to, uh, to, to cremate them. And it looks kind of similar to that pakeo that I said was uh, you know, just the round, rounded out a bit. So I'm not totally sure that's what that was. Um, the, the people on Easter Island developed a method of writing and they're the only Polynesians known to have developed writing. But um, the knowledge of how to read it died out uh, on those, those disasters I, I talked about with the Peruvians and slaving and, and, and so on. They, they, they killed off the, uh, the, the people who could read this. So how do you know it's writing rather than just decoration? If you look, here's, I'm going to call these Birdman again. I seem to use that word a lot. Birdman, 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 ear, Birdman. And... So there's three in a row, but it's not symmetric. It's not totally repeating. And that's not the way people usually decorate. And there's a lot of different, there's a fish, there's a wrench. Uh, I don't know, anyway. Um, maybe that's a lobster. Maybe they have lobsters there. Another fish, a little different kind of fish. It's got a fish with that fin there. And that's, anyway, uh, the people, the experts in this field. Uh, oh, this one's, there's somebody doing jazz hands. That's what I see there. Uh, so people are experts in the field who actually 
claim it's writing, but have not been able to decipher it. We don't have enough of it uh, to be able to decipher it, to give them a chance to, to decipher it. And it's carved with uh, obsidian and, uh, and shark's teeth, depending on the level of detail you want. Uh, by the way, there are no pieces of it left on Easter Island. We took it all and put it in museum somewhere else. This is another piece of it. Um, and, and, and they used every scrap of this wood. This, this writing actually goes right down to the bottom along here, and then it's written all the way up. Um, their sequence of writing is, is interesting, but I'll, I'll leave that if you have uh, questions later. Um, so that's, uh, that's the slides I had to show you. Um, was there anything else you wanted to know about Easter Island and the statues? Did I hear, did I hear somebody say, how did they move the statues? <laughs> and that's one of the things that has most bothered people. How were they moved from the quarry to the new location? So I, I lifted this uh, video from National Geographic. Who else would you? Who else would you steal things? Steal from the best, that's my motto. Can you all hear it? No, no sound. You might have to go back and unshare and turn on the, well, on the lower left, it says share sound before you actually share the okay. video. Okay, thank you. I... were carved out of the island's quarry of can you hear it now yes okay i'll try and, yes I'll try and back it up. Ah, yes there i can back it up okay here we are national geographic pretend that didn't happen national geographic Easter Island's Moai, the multi-ton statues, some measuring more than 20 meters in length and weighing more than 75 tons, were carved out of the island's quarry of volcanic tuff and then transported, some of them several miles over the island's rugged terrain. These statues were then placed on impressive platforms called Ahu. And this whole business of giant statues and platforms really cries out for an explanation. <laughs> Although some believe extraterrestrials move the Moai, scientists have more earthbound theories. Norwegian Thor Heyerdahl led a team to drag a 13-foot, 10-ton Moai on a tree trunk. <sighs> William Malloy used a desktop model to postulate the use of an inverted wooden V. Oral tradition says the statues walked. Czech engineer Pavel Pavel worked with Heyerdahl to move a statue with a twisting motion. Charles Love stood his Moai upright on a sledge over rollers. Hmm. 
but stories of the walking statues persisted. So Terry Hunt and Carl Lippo tried a new approach. They said three small groups could have walked to Moai, two to rock the statue forward and one from behind to stabilize it. In 2011, 18 people walked a 10-foot statue using this technique. While no one theory has proven the mode of locomotion, it's a new look at what may have happened centuries ago. So the uh, the the moai in the video is a replica. They did not risk an original. So that to me is a plausible mechanism. It would probably damage the base of the statue. Uh, so there is a theory that when they carved it out of the rock, they made the base wider and with a rounded front so it could rock more easily. Then when it was positioned, they would just trim off the bottom. That is probably also when they did the carvings on the back. Um, it is observed that along the paths from the volcano, there are some statues lying down, typically face down. Possibly this is a uh, result of a failure of the rockers and face down is what you expect. And that is my presentation, except for Lois. I'm gonna show you Another inhabitant of the island, as Ed mentioned. So this is a rather large turtle swimming around in the harbor. I followed this turtle for quite a while, trying to get good pictures of him or it. Um, and that's as good as I can get. So they um, actually on that, uh, just a minute. I thought I saw on the, one of the Rongo Rongo, I thought I saw a turtle. Must have been this one. It's a fish, fish, fish. No, I can't see it now. Oh, there it is, there it is. That's a turtle, see, there's a turtle. Mm -hmm. So turtle, squid, anyway, whatever. Um, alternate rows on the Rongo Rongo are, are upside down with respect to each other. It's the way they, the way they wrote, it's quite complicated by our standards, but they were inventing written language, so they get to make their own rules. Anyway, there you go, turtle. Mm -hmm. And that's that, I finished a little bit, uh, I probably talked too fast, that uh, <laughs> was shorter than, I, shorter than I thought. Well, that's okay, we can just ask a lot of questions. Yes. Rock on, David, rock on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, oh, I guess I should put my my hand up. Uh, well, oh. David, do you want to stop sharing? Yeah, I will stop sharing. Yeah, so we can see. We can hands. We hands. can see. We can see things. Yes. So, Jim, go ahead. Okay, uh, I I recall hearing something about some early writing system, some of the earliest Greek was written first one line left to right and the next read from right to left and, uh, and so on as the ox plows. Bustrophodonic the... as the ox plows, yes. yes. And this is slightly more, well, they started from the bottom, let's say the bottom left and they went all the way across to the right and then they spun it around. So that's what alternate rows are upside down with respect to each other. So they spun it around and started at where they'd finished and wrote right to left or this minute. Anyway, 
and wrote Vistrophodonically, but that's spinning the piece of wood on alternate lines. Yeah. Well, you to uh, you're, they're you're inventing it. They'd never seen anything written, so it's a totally independent system. Yeah, I I remember I recall reading something to the effect that they. Uh, they might have seen Europeans reading something, and then they just had to invent a way to so do So that's it. a critical question. Did the Rongo Rongo exist before 1722? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and and there, are, there, are, there are arguments about, the, you know, I'm telling you some things that I'm, I'm representing as fact, except I told you I knew some of them were wrong. Um, so that's my, that's my out. I'm not making anything up myself. That's my claim. Other people may be making it up. So there are claims. So one of the pieces of Rongo Rongo is on a paddle from a, a, a European ship. So clearly that was written after they came in contact with, with Europeans. Um, and, and some people say this isn't really a language, a written language is a proto language, which seems to me to be splitting hairs a bit. Um, but anyway, that's so that's. Uh, there, there is controversy about this. We don't know what it says, and we don't know when it was written, and we took it all away from them. Yeah. So, <laughs> to study it. Yeah, I remember reading something about the um, Cherokee language. The guy who invented it, Sequoia. Yes, yes Sequoia had seen your uh, whites reading and writing, but he didn't have a clue what it meant. So he invented his own. <laughs> but he used the same letters that we do. They just don't represent the same sounds. The yes. concept that a letter could have a sound just was, was amazing. And so he just took the letters we had, and he, but it, it, he made his own sounds for them. So you can see, you can read it, I and mean, you can look at it, you can copy it, but you can't figure out what it means uh, without, the, without the, it's a cipher. So yeah. Gavin, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Thank you very much, David. That was very interesting. I remember seeing uh, a movie called Rapa Nui. I think it was like from the late 80s. And I remember something about it that, that they really didn't have much of an idea how much of it was true. So a lot of this was best guess. But one of the ending or close to the ending was uh, uh, an iceberg floated by and many people got on it. Was that was there that, an explanation for why the, the population collapsed or part of an explanation was there anything like that that's uh i wouldn't have thought an iceberg could get that far that far north it's trop it's semi it's semi-tropical uh that would be pretty i, I don't know enough about icebergs to be able to say no but that okay. sounds pretty yeah, yeah. I, I suspect that that was surprising, but uh, it was always fascinating because there's so little fact to go on that. Sure, sugar cane don't... and icebergs don't usually go together. I, think. I would think not, but <laughs> anyways, thank you. Okay, Jim, again, another question? Comment. Um, let's see, the, uh, about the isolation, like uh, <clears throat> there's, there's a place in the ocean that it's called Point Nemo, which is the farthest from any land that, in the world. Go, go roughly south from uh, uh, Easter Island and, that, and you get to it. And that's where they uh, uh, deliberately dump uh, large uh, satellites if they can choose where to drop them. Okay. Now, Easter, you know, the, the Polynesians spread uh, throughout these various islands and um, Easter Island was one of the ones that was settled later. Um, and the Galapagos never was settled by Polynesians. No one ever, not until the Europeans came along, did anyone get to, uh, that we know of, uh, get to the, the Galapagos. Um, so uh, what was my point? We do, here's an interesting thing though, um, sweet potatoes. So they, they grew sweet potatoes on Easter Island as they did in other parts of Polynesia. So they brought it with them. But sweet potato isn't native to Polynesia, it's from South America. So probably the Polynesians sailed all the way to South America, brought back sweet potatoes and um, who knows what else. And uh, that's, that's the evidence we have for it. But the, the DNA doesn't, doesn't match up. 
Now, Heyerdahl's theory was that people had sailed from South America to Easter Island. That was he, you know, his balsa raft and so on. He proved that it could be done. Um, but we know you can do it with canoes uh, because that's how all these other islands were, were, were populated. Um, there was a, there's a story from the 1970s in which a, a New Zealand sociologist or archeologist or some sort of expert um, sneered at Polynesians and said they couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly have known what they were doing. All this migration was just accidental. It was just people who got lost in storms and got lucky and landed an island. So this uh, American, uh, as it happens, guy living in Hawaii was really annoyed about this because he, he thought the, the indigenous people were a whole lot smarter than this New Zealand guy thought they were. So he commissioned the local people to, to build a double canoe um, for him. And then he got uh, people with uh, knowledge of, the, uh, of, of how the Polynesians did their, uh, I can't think of their, their navigation. navigation. Navigation, yeah, thank you. Navigation. And he got them to sail it to Tahiti which from Hawaii to Tahiti is a pretty long ways. They just sailed it away. And then to really rub it in, he got this canoe. Uh, he got other people. He didn't do the sailing himself. He was busy doing other stuff. Um, sailed around the world, came to Canada, <laughs> went to Europe, took years to go around the world, but he sailed using traditional Polynesian navigation, found Canada, <laughs> uh, they may have cheated a little, knowing it was there, um, and ar around the world, back to uh, back to uh, Polynesia. So it can be done. Yes. And and I said there was about a month. I think they sailed from. I think they they tested it. And it was I think nineteen days or something. They did it, but um, it depends on the winds and things. Lady. Can you talk a little bit about um, what it's like today? I assume you flew in. What did you fly in on? How many flights go in and out of there? How many people live there? <laughs> um, what did they do all day besides so, the museum? So, so, so in 2009, which is, is when we went, uh, we flew in from Santiago, to Santiago de Chile, um, and uh, landed on that big runway. There are flights from at that, that time, flights from there, and there were flights from Tahiti, and that was that was it. And it's several hours of of, of flying to uh, hours and hours. Anyway, it's a long flight um, to to get there, and they they were only like twice a week. You 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 flew, and then three days later you flew back, and that was the next flight. You you couldn't there there weren't daily flights, um, and frankly, it's only sixty three square miles. Three days is is enough to see everything. There's a lot of statues and not a whole lot else. There's some chickens. They still have chickens. I have pictures of chickens if you want to see chickens. Um, there are some palm trees now. And, and Jim was talking about that at, at the beginning. Yeah, they're, they're, they're planting things and and trying to to, to, to grow stuff. Um, one of that, that resulted in, in a disaster last year. So there are people who are trying to farm cattle on Easter Island, and they want to farm cattle for to make money. Okay, so cattle eat grass, right? You can grow grass, um, but a lot of Easter Island is a park, a national park. So the, those those heads I showed you on the slope of the volcano, uh, they're in the grass. Um, but the farmer, the cattle guys, aren't allowed on that part of the grass. They have their own grass. But if you know much about cattle farming and so on, uh, the grass grows and then it turns dry and the cattle don't like the dry stuff. So you burn off uh, with stubble, but it isn't really stubble, just the, the dry grass, you burn it off. So you can get the new fresh new grass for the cattle to eat. So they set last year, they set fire to this and it burned and it set the whole national park on fire. And so a lot of the statues I showed you were damaged by that fire and it's a big uh, social uproar because most of what uh, the island makes us for tourism and destroying the moai, which are unique in the world, uh, from from a for a primitive people to have, have constructed these things. Um, was you think volcanic rock might be able to stand fire, but it's heating the outside but not the inside, so it cracks. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had flake big flakes coming off and so on. So the, I don't I don't know how that how they actually look now. 
but uh, that was a just just last year, this disaster last fall, I think. Anu. Hi, I have two two questions. First of all, this might seem like a stupid question, but how did the people who first came there know it was there? Did they just stumble oh, upon it accidentally? That, that's actually an excellent question. It's an excellent <laughs> question. I love that question. Well, how did they find all of these islands? And the answer is birds. There are birds, there are some birds, like like these, these sooty terns aren't helpful in this because they, they fly for years without landing. They can't land on the water. They can only land on land, but they, they, they leave their nests when they're a year old and come back maybe three years later and they're flying the whole time. They just scoop fish out of the water. Anyway, so birds that can't do that, birds that just go out and forage each day and then fly home. So you go, you're paddling mm -hmm. along, they're looking to see these birds. They're going that way. Well, it's morning, so they must be coming from an island. And you paddle where you think they're coming from and you keep going, maybe a little sail, a little paddle. Um, and you see where they go home in the evening. And that's where there's an island. Wow, that's so amazing. The, the, the story the people tell is that the chief who lived on the Marquesas or, or Mangareva had a vision that there was an island out there somewhere and, and he got people going for it. Well, that's probably how you get people going. If that island, how would he know there was an island there? Uh, I, I think maybe they, they did get lucky that they found an island. They just kept going till they found one. Might have got to South America if they had enough food to, had enough rats to eat. Um, but uh, that's how you find an island. Wow, okay. um, in, in, in modern times, there's a guy, an, an engineer, uh, in the, I'll say in the 1930s, but I could be off some decades, who wanted to go to Hawaii. He had, he had his own little boat, didn't have any navigation instruments. What he did was follow the flights of the airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> They're leaving San Francisco. They got to be going to Hawaii. There's nothing else there. So they just look up. Oh, okay, steer a little left. Yeah, steer a little right. Okay, so, yeah. That's amazing. And then my second question was, was there any kind of pattern to the alignment of the statues? Like see in Stonehenge, for example, the, those are like some kind of astronomical thing. Mm -hmm. Is there something like that here or not? I haven't heard that. Now, all the ones in the Ahu were knocked down. So if there was anything fussy mm -hmm. about the alignment, you wouldn't know it. And the ones on the land, they're kind of you know, stuck in the dirt. They're kind of tilting over. So I have not heard that. I didn't look for it. I didn't even think of it. Thank you. Um, now I'll have to go I'll have to go look. I haven't heard that. Um, the Ahu would be the things that could maybe be oriented. I know the statues were facing inland. That's the only thing I know about their their orientation is they're mm -hmm. facing away from the ocean. Mm -hmm. So we interpret, some people interpret that as rejecting the ocean because they didn't leave and you know, they landed there and they stayed there. And uh, they may have believed, this, which just doesn't make sense to me, that they were the only people in the world, but they knew they came from somewhere. So um, <laughs> I don't quite buy that, but anyway, that's the, that's the story. Well, thank you, it was very interesting. Good, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah then. Thank you again. When you were talking about the navigating, I heard something, and I'm sorry, I don't remember the details, but I thought it was the Hawaiian Islands or, or Polynesia, that they could navigate by the interference patterns of the waves to tell yeah. something there. But this is so far away from everything. I I can't believe that was, was something to navigate there. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the island makes, well, see, but Hawaii is, and the Hawaiian Islands are a whole lot bigger than Easter Island. So if, if there was a pattern from the waves caused by, by the islands, Easter Island is really a much smaller, yeah, really a much smaller effect. But yes, I've, I've heard about that uh, suggestions as to how they were uh, navigating using the waves themselves. But still, and if you were doing a second trip, you could figure that out. Uh, the waves go this way and the waves go. You, the first trip, I, I don't know. Yeah. Jim. Thank you. Fascinating. Yeah. So, uh, well, once you're on the second trip, I've, I'd, I'd heard that the one Polynesians navigating to Hawaii knew that the such and such a star passed overhead at the latitude of Hawaii. So that... Uh, 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 so they try to make sure that they were 
uh, ending up east of Hawaii. And then when they got to the right latitude, started sailing due west, do, <laughs> something like that. And then, uh, yeah, uh, but that would, but that would be a second trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there may be other people who sailed out, and you know, to be a little bit fair to the New Zealand guy, you sail off looking for something and you don't find it. No one knows what happened to you. Yes. No, this guy left, didn't come back. Did he find a place? Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. You know. Mm -hmm. what, do you know any more about the cult? Well, all we've got to go on are no, that sounded that sounded dismissive. Uh, what we have are the the stories of the people who live there now, and there was this narrowing of of the population. Um, so there's more. You know, you know, I didn't give you much detail uh, about about the cult, and what I've read, I, I think. Different people are telling different stories. And when we were there, uh, so we had our own guide, and we had the same woman for two or three days. But I was eavesdropping on the guide with a different group, and he was telling them different things. <laughs> now I trust our guide because you know we we, we were, she was our guide. This other guy, he must be just making stuff up. So I I think. As may be true in of, of guides in, in other places, you you're, you're trying to tell people what they want to hear um, to some degree. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm not totally totally sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So more questions, anybody? I can send you some links that that, that I have and see if you can you can read a couple of different accounts and, and see what's going on. Yeah. So, something kind of sort of related a bit. I kind of wonder, my impression is that the Maori in New Zealand got treated better. It's actually, it's actually pronounced Maori. 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 Yeah, okay. I just learned this the other day. Right. Anyway, <laughs> the Maori. Uh, uh, they sort of got treated better by the British than the, uh, than the Aborigines in Australia. And, you know, not super well, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but still better than the, than the ones in Australia. And I kind of wonder, just because they re, they, the British tended to respect somebody who could actually sail long distances. And <laughs> anyway, just sort of a... a David, David, I wondered if you found, like I can't, I imagine it was expensive and I imagine it took a long time and you had to spend three days on the island. Did you find it worth it with all that in mind? And would you, would you go again? Would you do a second trip? Um, I don't, I don't need, I, no, I wouldn't do a second trip. Um, the, the first one was only affordable in that sense because I was starting from, from Santiago. Uh, so this was a, a side trip from from there, back and forth from from Santiago, and we I saw everything there 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 was to see, I think. Uh, so so somebody asked me about what is it like now. Maybe it was you, Didi, was it? I, I didn't. I don't think I fully answered that. Um, so there's a small town. Yeah, the people uh, there with, with with people and uh, a lot of dogs. I don't know. There's there's dogs just running loose everywhere. They they form little packs, but they don't attack people. They don't do anything. Just dogs hanging out together. One 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 adopted us. Um, uh, my so one brother and his wife left, and the other three of us stayed on because the one brother had heard three days was enough. And I think I actually was there five days. Um, in, in the end, and uh, three days was enough because we didn't see anything more in, the, in, in those two days. Except this dog adopted us and followed us for a whole day. We weren't feeding him. He was just a happy dog following us around and got annoyed when, when we wanted to go home and leave him. But, you know, he was possibly bored. He might have been he, bored. He, he was bored, yeah. There's not much to do <laughs> in this island. So so it's a fairly, you know, it's, it's volcanoes. But we just walked up the volcano. They're not very high. Um, you know, it's not exactly mountain climbing to walk up to that that lake, the the, the second one, is, the ones with the reed, one of the reeds, and we 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 just walked up. Um, we walked up the other one as, as well, but uh, they're not that high. 
Um, so it's fairly flat. It's not, there's not much going on. The people there, um, you know, there's a little convenience store, you know, there's, there's grocery stores and, or at least one. Um, and then at night they did a, they did a, a display, a cultural display for us with dancing and so on. And I have a video of that, but it wasn't, wasn't good enough quality to, uh, to show you. Um, Anyway, it's, it's what you see in, in Hawaii and other, other places, people dancing and it looks pretty and they have costumes and so on. And you have no idea how authentic it is. But, you know, the guy who was running the clerk in the grocery store was was one of the dancers. You know, there's, there's not that big a population. Um, but their main thing is is tourism. Although here's here's the thing that, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old lefty, sorry. Uh, there are people on Easter Island living there who have enough money that they import rock for their yards so i saw a rock wall which is the wrong kind of rock for easter islands so they've imported this rock on a ship on a little boat and plunked it down in their front yard to show that they have the money to get foreign rock this island is, is just rock there's nothing but rock there and they've got to buy expensive rocks and bring them in you know that's that's some kind of uh, well anyway not my thing. Vincent. Uh, so I did notice in one of the pictures, a modern convenience that they had on the island was a vehicle, a car. Oh, yes, there are cars. Yeah, there are roads. They drive around. Yeah, on dirt roads. Yeah. On dirt road. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. is amazing. Um, so they, or they obviously imported the cars. They couldn't have. Yeah, no, there, there's no metal. There's no metal there. Yeah, and the fuel, and yeah. the fuel. Yep. Yeah. Um, the uh, and that was sort of amusing. You know, we were in a our guide had a car to to take us these places, and uh, or a vehicle of some sort. We got off to you know far away from Hangaroa, and there was an, another tourist whose car had broken had rented a car. To go on their own and it had stopped working and then got out a cell phone and tried to call and uh, you know, we drove up and what are you doing i'm trying to call the people i rented the shop with a cell phone we don't have cell phones on yeah. easter island <laughs> oh. <laughs> there were no towers you know there's nothing out there you know there's there's no people there's no there's no need for it. oh so when we got back we told whoever to you know not, not we but our guide told somebody to hit your person stuck out there um you should, you should go get them Gee. somebody did anyway didn't we? well That's given right. the dimensions it wouldn't take more than a couple of cell phone towers to cover the island yeah but who needs them and that was 14 years ago so you know maybe they have yeah. cell phones now yeah um for the for the tourists right and mm -hmm. there's not that much it's else going on wait a minute 169 square kilometers so yep. We're talking maximum distance to walk anywhere would be something like 13 or so kilometers. Well, I gave the dimensions uh, of the uh, yeah. of the island, which I would have to. No, 163. Well, it depends on what the tide is, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's something but, like that. Yeah, so I said 14 miles. By seven miles oh. is is the triangle. So it's fourteen miles the long way and seven miles the the, the perpendicular. Okay. okay. Um, so oh, okay. yeah, you're you are you are not going to be so far from from anywhere. Yeah. You couldn't you couldn't walk if you wanted to put the effort in. Yeah. A couple hours. A couple hours. You could. Use. Well, and, that, and that's good because they had to move those statues. <laughs> you're not going to move not those. Very but that the the Ahu with the 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 biggest number of statues on it is just down. It's it's the closest one to the volcano to the quarry, right. so that that became the best place to put them. Yeah, just over there, just downhill. It's not far. Yeah. Uh, I will point out that the so a couple things with the National Geographic one. Um, that's that's that was a nice level place, but the quarry is up a volcano. I say it's not as you know high or steep volcano, but it's definitely a you know quite a slope. Hmm. Um, so I think it makes it a little bit harder than than they're uh, representing it. That yeah. nice walking thing, yeah. Try that on a slope. Uh, well, it will at least be easier to do it downhill than uphill. <laughs> Maybe. 
Yeah, yeah yes, sure. And the, the energy, the force will be with you. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, the, the face planting is, is going to be a, a, a frequent thing, I think. Yeah. And how did you get it? So I showed you that one, a giant statue in the quarry. Okay, you've got to stand it up in order to do all that. And that's going to be an effort too. Anyway, this, that, that it wasn't, I'm, I'm pretty confident it wasn't uh, spacemen or, or uh, some supernatural force yes. uh, that people could do it. Or it's our 20th just, century uh, crane. <laughs> yeah, well, we that, that works for sure. We've established that. The 80 ton statue, that's pretty good. It's a pretty good crane. So Brent, your question. Yeah, there was some talk of rats, and I'm just wondering, was that an issue when you were there and uh, possibly related? Are they under control maybe by the dogs? Because what are dogs eating? Oh, maybe that's what the dogs are for, is to eat the rats. Mm -hmm. So, um, in fact, um, probably, you know, so did the rats come by accident or were they brought on purpose? Because Polynesians, uh, many Polynesians eat rats, eat Polynesian rats. Let's be clear, they're different species than the Norwegian, nasty Norwegian rats, um, sorry, sewer rats. Uh, and there are, there are people in other parts of the world, in Africa and so on, eat different, different varieties or, or species of, of, of rat. So they may have brought them on purpose in order to eat them. They had chickens, they had rats, and that's it for, for your diet, for your meat diet. Uh, fish, of course, that was intention and birds came by. Um, so uh, it's an excellent point. Do, is there a rat problem there? I, I don't know. I didn't ask. What were, what were the dogs eating? Like, are they being fed by the... They belong to people, I think. I don't think they're, they're, they're wild dogs and, or, or strays in that sense. They just, they just run around hanging out together. It was just funny to see uh, a little pack of various sizes of dog, not not little like our dog, but you know, medium to large dogs, all just running around, so, those, you know, and not and not doing anything bad. Were you afraid that you were eating rats then when you were there? No, we ate, we ate a lot of chicken. <laughs> I think we probably had some fish. I'm trying to remember. You're uh, in this chicken. I don't know. <laughs> so, the four-legged chickens, you know. Yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've well, when I was in Ecuador, I ate a grub, a smoked grub. It wasn't a live grub. It was a smoked grub. That was a, oh, you the, the, the size of the size of my thumb, and it was smoked, and so I ate it. You oh. didn't. You didn't see our documentary about uh, bug eating, right? The five, the five wives. Remember one? that? No, there was a we had a movie oh. night of movie night. Uh, some documentary about finding alternative foods, and it was bugs. Mm. I don't think I did see that one. <laughs> yeah, no, and they they were eating grubs. Yeah, sure. Yeah, people eat cricket. Yeah. I've got some. I've got some uh, toasted crickets. I think somewhere in the house that my daughter bought me. Oh, some chocolate, oh, chocolate covered ants and some uh, spicy uh, crickets. I've had chocolate covered baby bees. But, <laughs> um, is there is there anything other than tourism that supports? Well, there's the cattle industry. Oh, really? uh, people did try sheep, um, and there's there's not a lot else. They they've, they have no natural resource, mm -hmm. uh, just the mm -hmm. rock. It's just a lot of rock and some yeah. grass and yeah, a few you said trees. Something, you, said something, you said something about their head being seabirds nesting on there until the humans arrived and the rats uh, with them. Or yep. at least there's evidence for that. Yeah. Um, well, these this island probably had a huge number of, of, of seabirds mm -hmm. because uh, it's in the middle of nowhere and there's fish around. Fish for the taking if you're a bird, uh, don't need a canoe. Um, and then you come and you make your nest and you leave, shall we say, residue from the fish on the island. So that was my. Oh, that would be good. Uh, how many people yeah, have to, to fertilize the, the soil? How many people have heard of the Guano Islands Act passed by the U.S. Congress in sometime in the 19th century? I don't know that act, but I know about Guano Islands. Yeah, uh, for sure. Okay. 
yeah, basically, uh, basically anybody could claim for the U.S. an, an island that had guano on it too. <laughs> yeah, for the for the fertilizer for phosphorus. Yeah. I think that's mostly so, phosphorus. Did you? Oh, so David, did you have a rocking good time while you were there? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Just, uh, you, 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 you well, said you said it had a lot of rocks. <laughs> yeah. You said something about also visiting Falklands and South Georgia. Yes. Yes. So, do you know uh, when the, the tourism yep. began? Because I'm thinking, what did they do before that? That I guess that was the sheep farming. Well, uh, what did they eat? Uh, what did they do? They were they were they were agriculture. You know, they grew sweet potatoes, taro, sugarcane. Uh -huh. And so they just. Hmm, no, what do, what do uh, you know people do? when you live on an island you know that's you eat what's around um or you starve to death which is you know one of the things that happened and then they uh the, the land was taken away by you know, europeans mm -hmm. uh, and they were herded i think they ended up that that hangaroa which is i'm saying is the, really the only town there um they didn't have a choice but to live there i mean it was an existing place but they got pushed off the land uh so people could Try other things like sheep. I don't know why sheep, but sheep are in the Falklands too, by the way. Um, well, let's see. Sounds kind of like what the uh, the Scottish clearance is. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. Mm. It's the people who own the land. Why well, you don't really own the land? You have it. You have a piece of paper showing you have title to it. No, well then, too bad. Mm. Well, people don't have paper. <laughs> yeah. So of the population that is there now, roughly what percentage have indigenous backgrounds? Um, I'm Adrian. I, I don't know. I'm going to make a, a wild guess. Oh. Honey, Adrian. Wants... Hi, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian Fish wants to uh, there now. Yeah, hello. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, there she is. Ah, oh, you made it home. <laughs> I made it home and I've been cooking dinner while listening. It's great. And I was able okay. to see the pictures, which was really nice. Good. So, cool. so thank you. It was really good. Yeah. And you're leaving next week for uh, new um, Australia uh, the week after the week after. Oh, yeah. yeah. But uh, you, you were answer answering a question, David, about the how many indigenous people were there, I believe. Yeah, I don't know. Um, as I say, there's any of the Rapa Nui genetics is from 36 people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and there's about, now I wrote 5,000 people. I've had other people have seen some other estimates of it. Um, so people came there from other, like from Tahiti, for example, people moved there from Tahiti, people moved there from Chile. Um, there's, a, there's a usual fuss uh, about who can immigrate and, and so on. It can't sustain very many people, so you have to really keep the population. Uh, you have to keep the population low. Um, so there's fusses about immigration, who should be allowed, and, mm -hmm. and so on. So I'm not sure. I could. I will. I'll say a thousand, uh, but I'm making that up. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is by no means all the people, and not all the people speak the Rapa Nui language. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I think in modern times there there are probably more people now that speak it than there did 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a it's you know, it's a thing now. Uh, uh, now let's see, they've been separated for some centuries from it from other Polynesians. Yes. But I got the impression that they're what that the languages haven't changed enough between Polynesians. So, so when Cook did I I mentioned Cook and, and and I showed a picture of a ship. Cook actually did travel there and he had a crewman, a Polynesian crewman, but I forget what island he's from. And he, the, the claim from Cook, which is a, a while ago, is that um, about 80% of the language was, this This guy could understand about 80% of what they said. Wow. Yeah. So, mm. I, I, but I have no idea how, how that works in other parts of Polynesia, whether that 80% is high, low, mm. it sounds high you know, yeah. to me, but is that comparable to how the people from Pitcairn, well, that's a bad example, yeah. the people from Tahiti talk to the people from the Marquesas yeah. or, 
or Hawaii uh, well, or so on. I, yeah. I don't know enough about those languages. I've heard that Icelandic See you, Neil. Is, is essentially Good to see you again. That yeah. Hi, Neil. Uh, I've heard that modern Ice Icelandic is essentially identical to the Old Norse of the people who settled there. So that I, I have that, heard that, that, yeah. A thousand years might still be not so. Well, there was a claim I read a few, quite a few years ago, that shepherds in Sardinia spoke Latin. Yeah. Mm. Not Italian, but Latin. Wow. But that was a while ago. This generations ago. Was, if it was ever true, it's probably not true today. But uh, that was a claim. Well, I heard once that some people, I think it was in Appalachia, got really isolated and sp practically spoke Victorian English. There's so some, if, 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 you, if, you, if you live in North Carolina, if you go around in North Carolina, for example, um, the islands off the coast there, uh, the, the, the accents in different places, including the islands off the coast, including the, the Appalachians, very different, very different sounds. The, 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 you know, like I won't say a different language, but really different sounds. Uh, as you say, isolated populations. Yeah. Isn't Quebecois rather like the French of a few centuries ago? Yeah. I don't know if you want to say that to a, to a Quebecois, but yeah, it's what I had heard is it's, it's rural French from a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. So, you know, my, my Quebecois ancestors came there in you know, 1645. And uh, oh. so not so many people came after, well, I guess in the 1700s and so I'm so old, but yeah. rural, because you wouldn't move from a city out into to be a farmer in Quebec, and not if you were sensible. Um, so you uh, rural, rural farm. You know, farm French from a couple hundred years ago is what I've heard. Just don't quote me on that. So your your ancestors moved to Quebec about the same time a, a, some, one of my ancestors moved to Massachusetts. Okay. Yeah. Maybe they knew each other. We should check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Weren't that many people there, but it's still, yeah. it's a fair distance to walk. So let's see, you've got a, sh you've got a shirt, something about the airspeed. Oh, yes. This is the only uh, bird shirt that I have. And I didn't get a T-shirt in, in the Galapagos. I showed you a picture of the keychain I, I got. Okay. So this is this is a bird-related uh, T-shirt. It's close as I can come. And then I'm going to swallow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's the the, the Monty Python uh, Holy Grail yeah. uh, movie. Search for the Holy Grail. Well, I am proud of my ancestry. <laughs> that's your specific ancestor, that chimp. Oh, absolutely. This looks, looks like a pretty modern chimp to me. <laughs> well, thank you for the presentation, David. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Helen. Thank you for letting me join in. <laughs> yeah, and but I have to go now. I'm kind of tired, so I'm All right. one of those early birds. I go to bed early and get up early. <laughs> so, well, so glad you came. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you. I'll uh, yeah. I'll Skype you tomorrow then. Okay. Thanks, honey. All right. Okay. okay. So well. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. -bye. Yes. And Dee Dee did say put in the message there. Notice that there's a, a blood donor okay. clinic coming up, and yes. so uh, she could use some more volunteers for that. Yeah. I'm surprised. Uh, I, th I, th I, th I think I already put my name in for that. Oh, well, that's good. Yes, you did. Yeah. Oh, and, surprised they don't have a picture of a vampire with like real <laughs> you. Oh, that's a good idea. Anyway, I want you. <laughs> and uh, yeah. we also have an, a, web, a webinar coming up next month that is uh, pretty Let's exciting. See. We have Joel. Um, no, what the heck? No, Phil, so, Phil Zuckerman, he's a professor at Pitzer College in Southern California, is going to join us by Zoom. And he will be talking about why are atheists so moral? And he's going to tell us, he's going to give us data uh, about how moral atheists are. And uh, 
talk about the reasons. So I think that uh, should be very interesting. He's quite well known for uh, a lot of the books that he authors. Uh, I became a fan when I read Society Without God and almost decided to move to Denmark after I read it. <laughs> uh, but he and he but he's a sociologist he's written a lot he created the first uh, secular studies major on any college or university campus and uh, so he has quite a background so I hope uh, hope you'll come and uh, attend his webinar so what day is that uh, Lois that's going to be on the 29th of so that's a that's a Wednesday? Yes. Okay. A month and a day from now. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So any more questions for David? That was such a fascinating presentation, David. Yeah, I really Thank enjoyed you. it. Yeah. So are you, uh, are you going to do a presentation on the, uh, on the Falklands in South Georgia? Uh, I hadn't, uh, hadn't planned it. It's uh that's that's where you go if you if you if you like penguins, I can tell you where to find them. <laughs> if you like albatrosses, they have those too. And they have them by the hundred thousand. If you want to see a hundred thousand albatrosses and they're all squawking and doing the other things that birds do. And the same with the penguins, even even more so. Um, the penguins are, you know, come back from the water and they're looking for their young ones and looking for their partners and so on and so they're squawking yeah. it's it's an incredible noise yeah. um and uh i've yeah. I, I think here's the thing i learned about i'll tell you the one thing one i'll tell you a thing i learned about albatrosses so they nest on tufted grass and so you look out at this field with tens of thousands of albatrosses and they're sitting on tufts which are their nests and their nest they're covering eggs um so how far apart are the nests? So they're covering acres and acres, square kilometers of albatross. So I worked this out. I watched them because we got to sneak up on them. They didn't really care. Um, they are, so here's, here's two albatrosses. How far apart are they? Okay, so here, here's my hand. Each arm is an albatross. Just too far to peck. Just too far to peck. If you're gonna have a fight, it takes both of you. This one can't reach over and peck this one without getting off the nest. They are one albatross peck length apart. <laughs> that is and so that's where they're, and sometimes you know, they, they, they start just, you know, squawk, 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 squawk. Um, although a hilarious thing I saw. So in amongst the albatrosses are rockhopper penguins, which are a little bit, you know, albatrosses are big. You know, an albatross can have a wingspan of, of, of eight, nine feet. Wow. Um, not necessarily the ones I was looking at, but these these are big. Anyway, and rockhopper penguins are only about about this big, so they use the albatrosses as protection. There there are some other predator birds. Albatrosses don't eat penguins, so that's fine. They just hop along in between. So I saw this rockhopper penguin with a piece of grass. It's picked up a piece of grass. It's hopping along, going to its nest, and this albatross just reaches over, snatches the grass away from the <laughs> rockhopper. Oh, no. The rock hopper, who's only this big, <laughs> just just made such a row, squawking and squawking and squawking at this at this albatross for stealing its grass, <laughs> which I just thought was hilarious. hilarious. Our, our oldest daughter was was on this part of the trip, and she said, "Ah, she'd seen what happened just before that. That rock hopper had stolen that grass from an albatross nest." <laughs> A different albatross and was running away with it when this you know second albatross snatched it so all this furor you stole my grass yeah you stole it first <laughs> uh anyway so that's albatrosses and rock hoppers and that was in on uh i think in the falkland the falkland islands well, we, we might uh, have to impose upon you again to so so i gave a a, a, a talk so this this talk I, I adapted it from a talk i gave to the uh Calgary Rock and Lapidary Club. So I had more about the kind of rocks and minerals and so on in, in that presentation. Uh, so I added in some more about the bird cult uh, and, and uh, that, that, that for, for, for you and took out some of the more about trachyte and 
scoria and stuff well, um, david but so I, I gave them another talk on the metallurgy and stonemasonry of the incas Ooh. wow which has some more about you know rocks and 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 metals and things in it and and uh and stuff if so uh lois i can i can share a copy of that presentation with you and you can look at it and see if if it's oh, something you think people would be interested in okay that's, that's what i gave a, a year or so ago uh there's no nothing nothing, nothing about gods and worship okay. and stuff there's kings in it but they had a anyway sounds good yeah thank you and by the way while we're speaking of this if anybody would like to um, present a webinar just let me know and we'll discuss it and if you know of someone else you want to hear from you know that somebody knows something interesting uh let me know about that or just a subject oh. if there's a topic that you're really interested in and uh want us to try to find somebody who's an expert on that so we're we're always looking for good ideas and good sources uh we've had some really terrific webinars i'm i'm quite excited about uh the ones that we've that we've had and that i've got a few in mind i'm extremely excited about uh next month's so anybody with ideas let me know uh, richard dawkins <laughs> yeah right get him to give us a talk yeah uh -huh. <laughs> oh. and and david we love it when you rock on it just keep keep rocking <laughs> hey. nobody nobody oh. laughed at that oh, oh there we go <laughs> you're supposed to groan and boo at at yes yes hey, yeah uh, so uh no rock hopper penguins on easter island though huh no there are penguins uh, so on another trip i went to the uh, uh galapagos actually i've been to the galapagos oh. twice now and there are penguins uh there really um the northernmost yeah. penguins in the world i understand northernmost in the world yep and they may go extinct in not very there's not very many of them and with a little climate warming they may disappear completely you can you can count them they're they're in the dozens or or or, or so i think but uh i was i saw them and uh, uh my daughter went swimming with them i mean she was swimming and they went whew, past like little rockets uh, or torpedoes i guess if it's in the water little so, torpedoes going uh, past was that with a wetsuit i understand that the uh, that the water is quite cold at, at because of the uh the current up the west coast of south america yeah so it's it's the humboldt current coming from the antarctic and, uh, and it, it hits the galapagos and wells up and that's how the the penguins can survive wow. so the water is just a, on, on the part of the islands that they're on it's the water is colder there i think she probably did wear the top half of a wetsuit yeah yeah not a whole wetsuit just a, just a top half I see, but she, now, she was snorkeling is it because the penguins need cold water or because the fish they eat need cold water or do you it's, know it's it's both it's both i think but yes yeah the, the nutrients you know feed the fish and the fish then the penguins eat the it, 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 so the, all that comes with the humboldt current so i've, yeah. I've heard it's temperature and but I, I agree it's also the uh, it's also the nutrients they're amazing the, the they look so clumsy on land yeah. seeing them swim is just amazing and they say this the opposite about us they look pretty good on land but they're in the water they're hopeless yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. well anything else anybody have some ideas or suggestions right now that you'd like to tell me about for for future reference oh Let's see who's an expert in what we've got here. Stone cold silence. Stone. <laughs> cold. You know, a few years ago, I I did give a little talk on the f figuring out how old things are. <laughs> how old? Oh, yeah. yeah, I might look over that. Look over what I did and revise and uh, 
and do a little revision or something? Or? Well, let me see it, you know, send me some information and we'll talk about it. Yeah, like. Okay, what's everybody's expertise? Yeah. Brent, what's your expertise? Listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Oh. That is a good one. Obscure 80 sports cars. <laughs> Brent, you are an expert on on green living, aren't you? Sorry, that was a question for me? Yes. Yeah, you uh, well, I, I frame it as sustainable living. Yes, yeah, sustainable. Mm -hmm. Trying to find um, more sustainable practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll have to think about that. <laughs> maybe in a year or two, uh, maybe in about a year and a half from now, I might have a, a bit of a presentation on uh, potentially uh, looking at doing geo um, uh, some uh, geothermal at, at my place geothermal uh, heat pumps oh, oh. Uh, that's ground source ground source heat heat pump yeah at, at, your, at, at your home at your home yeah, yeah oh, so that, that would yeah. be interesting yeah well it's it's a little unique because of the nature of my house it's very narrow access into the backyard so it's not very easy to get into so it may not happen but um i'm i've got someone doing an analysis right now so. yeah okay uh yeah because because geothermal is also drilling a long way down for uh for much hotter stuff than you can get <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're using the the existing uh, dead wells oil wells for right. geothermal yeah. is, is a proposal right. oh. uh there's a company in Calgary that is, they're claiming that they've got the techniques for doing it cheaply and um, uh, uh, I guess, I guess it'd be fairly easy to drill deep enough for say district heating. Um, you'd want somewhat deeper to generate electricity. There's apparently uh, an apartment building in Kensington that gets their heating through geothermal. Really? So there's, uh, they have yeah. no heating bill. Mm. Uh, is, okay, uh, okay, now, is this geothermal is in ground source heat pump where the heat essentially comes from the sun and, and then you have electricity pump, uh, pumping water, pumping heat from the, I Five don't know the round or yeah I, I don't know the details but uh yeah. I was talking to someone and they said that uh, that building it's heated by geothermal there's no yeah. heating yeah. costs yeah I, yeah I get, yeah I'm just a little do, annoyed that these that the same word gets used for two rather different things it's, so it's, it's, it's easy to it's easy to confuse easily confused yeah that's yeah well there's a town yeah. well inside Yellowstone Park the town of Mammoth uh, is completely geothermal, but, but of course, yeah. <laughs> Stone Park is rather geothermal. Yeah, well, I, I, get, I, I guess in principle, you could get a, to do a little space heating at, at Banff, uh, more than just the, uh, the, uh, the, the pool at the, <laughs> mm -hmm. on Sulphur Mountain. <laughs> I don't think that's heated by geothermal anymore. I think there is something built underneath it. Okay, I I did hear something about some shift in the groundwater flow meant it, meant it wasn't quite as warm as it had been. So that no, they had to supplement with some artificial heating. No, they had people get sick from the oh. natural water. Yeah. Oh. It's like, well, rather than us getting sued, we're just going to have to do it artificially. So at least that's what I was told. So don't quote me on that, but I don't think it's natural. 
Well, David, that was a very informative and very entertaining presentation. I like your sense of humor. Thank you very much. Yes. Glad, glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have a book club in uh, two weeks, more or less two weeks from now. Uh, I guess it would be a little less than two weeks. Uh, uh, I'd have to I'll work it out. I'll work it yeah. out. Anyway, something like two weeks from now. And it's a book that Gavin uh, suggested. So I'm uh, encouraging him. Yeah, it'll be nine days. Oh boy, I better read that book. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a very short book. It's quite it's quite readable. Okay, because okay. <laughs> I've got nine days to read it. Fit, okay. fit in with all my uh, other oh, activities. I, right. I checked. Uh, okay, not available from the public library. So I guess I'll have to get a Kindle version. It was cheap from Kindle. Yeah. So. What is it called? When violence is the answer. That's what it's called? Yeah. Oh. Yes. Well, actually, mm. I've read it, well, at least a fourth of it so far, and it is mm. very good. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I would something a little little different from our usual reading. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I guess that's the answer. I, I, I guess if the impossible conversations uh, really does turn out to be impossible, <laughs> you might want the second Okay, one. yes, yes. That was... <laughs> yeah, Is I, that yeah. through anthropology or <laughs> a study of it or something or? Self-defense. Yeah. Self-defense. Um, yeah. Uh, Okay. Oh, and sorry, David, one of the things that because of your the rock club that you talked about, uh, I loved how you got in conspicuous consumption by bringing in different rock to Easter Island. <laughs> but, yeah, well, well played on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, I don't know. Bring it. Yeah. I don't know. I think I don't know. Bring in plant useful plants that <laughs> or something. And, well, Pet rock. A hedge, of, a hedge of something that that, that does some, produces something edible, <laughs> maybe. Oh, that's something. Pet rock. Sweet, sweet potatoes are pretty calorie and and vitamin intense. They're they're not a bad, not a bad choice at all for for food. You you yeah. mentioned this is a very rich person that, that imported the rocks. Mm. Where where would someone get that kind of wealth, or did they just move their uh, after? Thing. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I, I I just noticed this house, a nice house, and a rock wall in front. And I, that's not Easter Island rock. <laughs> did they have like a, a fairly? Um, so what they did with New Zealand to get uh, internet access is they had this huge ship that uh, laid cable along the ocean bottom. Do they actually have uh, internet access on the um, on Easter Island? I don't remember. Uh, um, well, now they could probably do it via Starlink. Yeah, yeah use satellite. Yeah, probably but, could use satellite now, but- But, but the, the, the cables, back. most of the internet is run on cables under the ocean. If you're yeah. interneting something in Europe, it's, it's it's big cables between, you know. Uh, um, yeah, there's this yeah. guy um, Fraser Kane who do, who uh, does this astronomy cast uh, video uh, with the and uh, with that actual astronomer, and um, so he'd moved out into an off grid spot in. Uh, on Vancouver Island, and he was getting his internet via Starlink, but uh, it was, uh, but then the fiber came through, and uh, at least if you've got the fiber, it's, he's sort of better off with the fiber, <laughs> but, you know, how, 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 we, how hard is it to get a cable to wherever you are? If it's hard, then you then the satellite is going to be the best or, option. Or if, there, if there's not enough people to to make it worth the money. Uh, yeah, yeah, so a friend of mine in uh, lives outside Sudbury, Colin Field. Uh, yeah. And he, he uh, he's using Starlink to remote, to, to do remote uh, work at the Tom Baker. Yeah. So he reaches out from near Sudbury through Starlink 
and uh, into real time looking at CT scans and things, the stuff that I do plan checking uh, from the Tom Baker. Actually reaches out, I think, to Edmonton and then through a network from Edmonton to, to Calgary and then Calgary. He does it all through Star is that, is that, is is that Starlink. Is that called Starlink? Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. This is this is Elon Musk's uh, satellite system. Oh well, then I yeah. don't really want to use it. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, uh, like yeah, he's uh, hey, he's fi he's figured out how to get uh, the cost of things in orbit uh, cheaper. That uh, uh, that doesn't that doesn't mean he's right on something else. But hey, if he's yeah. Yeah, it seemed like it'd be a terrible person, but they can still provide something very useful in the meantime. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's he's something, all right. <laughs> uh, the, you know, Werner, Werner von Braun, who was a big NASA guy, was a you know a German Nazi. Yeah. Uh, but so rockets so. gets up there. Who goes where they come down? That's not my department. Says Werner von Braun. Yeah. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, good night, everybody. Well, good, good, night. Night. good night, Vincent. Yeah. Good, right. oh, night. Too. Oh, good night. Good night, Joel. Good night, all. Okay. So, so, I get the, so is, everybody, is everybody leaving now? I don't know. I'm just going to speak to Karen to see if she's actually there or if <laughs> if uh, she left her connection and went off someplace else. Are you there, mm -hmm. Karen? Yes, I'm here. I saw your presentation, enjoyed it. Good, so good, much. good, good. No, um, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Yes, I, I invited a, a bunch of people. And uh, but then when I said it was going to be recorded, we're still recording. We could probably stop yes, the recording. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, then other people said, yeah, just send me a link to the recording. Uh, 